Hello and welcome to another episode of the Answer Podcast. I'm your host, Captain Manuel Calo, and today we have an incredible guest with us, Carla Meyers, a retired captain in the U.S. Navy Supply Corps with over 25 years of distinguished service in both military and civilian sectors. Carla is a trailblazer in the world of the logistics, supply chain management, and diversity, equity, and inclusion. Throughout her career, she had led teams through complex challenges from Navy combatant ships to humanitarian missions, and now brings her expertise into the commercial world as a specialist leader at Deloitte. Today, we are going to dive into her journey, her accomplishments, and the lessons she learned along the way. But before we get started, I want to share a quick disclaimer. The views and opinions ex expressed on the ANSA podcast are solely those of the individuals involved and do not necessarily represent those of the Department of Defense, any government entity, or Deloitte. Without further ado, I want to present Carla Meyers. How are you doing, ma'am, today? I'm doing well, Manuel. Buenas tardes. Buenas tardes, buenas tardes. Gracias por estar con nosotros aquí en el, en el podcast de Anso. Thank you for being here today. And as I mentioned in my introduction, we're going to actually dive into your, uh, um, you know, your background, who is Carla Meyers, and so we can share your lessons learned throughout the military and actually transition into the civilian sector. So just walk, uh, walk us to your, to your life. Thank you so much. It's a great honor to be here with I am the product of immigrant parents. Uh, my mother was born in Cartagena, Colombia, mm -hmm. And my father was from uh, Colón, Panama. Mm, okay. And I was born in Monterey, California, back in the day. Okay. I was the youngest out of five. My father was also retired army. Oh, okay. And nice. uh, four out of us five children served in the military. Nice. So I see, like, like uh, every time I, I join the podcast, I people know I'm a soldier myself, and I am help uh, answer to actually do the podcast. So that's pretty awesome to hear that you that were, he was like a army soldier. And now, so you come, you come from like an actual family uh, of military. So can you actually, what, what actually drove you to actually start joining the military? In this case, the navy. To be honest, I didn't even want to join the military. Oh, wow. uh, we had um, frequented uh, Fort Dix Army Base when I was growing up, and I would see <laughs> women soldiers in mm -hmm. their uniforms mm -hmm. looking haggard, um, not knowing that they were coming fresh from the field uh, exercises. Okay. And that was when I was around uh, 13 years old, and I said, wow, if that's what the military does to you... I don't want anything to do with that. <laughs> okay. And so when it uh, came time for me to select where I wanted to go to school and um, what I wanted to study, mm -hmm. it came down, quite honestly, to dollars and cents. Oh, okay. I had uh, purposed it in my heart that um, my parents wouldn't have to pay for my mm -hmm. schooling. I was doing very well in high school, straight A student. Mm -hmm studying all the things, getting all the honors, and I felt that someone should be uh, literally paying me to go to school. So okay. that was my mindset at the time. The military provided options for mm -hmm. me, and I considered the Army, Air Force, and Navy um, okay. just to cast a, a wide net. And at the end of the day, it was the, the Naval Academy <laughs> okay, that's that, uh, offered me the appointment and okay. the rest is history. So, so that's, that's a great point that you brought to the table that you actually, that your motivation to actually join the armed forces was like, it's, I need somebody to take care of my tuition or pay my college, etc. And that was basically your motivation other point that i can uh, i can say is like you actually uh, got you got different opinions like hey I'll, do i want to join the army or do i want to join the air force it, you you were not married to actually one military branch um so so how was that so do you go to some recruiter stations or how that was the process when you start getting you know like uh, the information about the military branches back then? Well, I knew I wanted to go to college. Mm -hmm. So I was either considering ROTC okay. or the service academies. Mm -hmm. 
And again, I just cast a wide net. And so for ROTC programs, I understood that you had to be accepted into the the school first. Okay. And so I, I, uh, I endeavored to <laughs> be accepted to all of the schools that I applied to. Of course, you get the the rejections and acceptances mm -hmm. and and all of that. And um, sometimes I wasn't an al an alternate mm -hmm. considered for the other services. I guess my my bias toward the Navy kind of uh, showed through, but did all the things nice. and uh, you know made all the milestones and uh, and all of that. But again, ultimately, it was the Naval Academy um, where I felt at home. Nice. And how was your experience in the Naval Academy once you actually joined? It was it was quite the experience. I I must admit I followed two of my brothers mm -hmm. to the Naval Academy. I uh, my late brother Charlie was class of 80 and my brother Eddie was class of 82. Uh, mm -hmm. one told me not to go, the other one told me to go, and I guess in my rebellious uh, <laughs> teenage years I went. Okay. And um, it was quite the experience. This was back in the late 80s. Okay. We, my particular class was the 10th class of women to okay. go through the Naval Academy. So from a cultural perspective, there were still some growing pains. Mm, I see. I see. And then how you overcame, overcame that in that situation when you were like in the Naval Academy? It was difficult, um, you know, the, my faith and my sponsors, my local sponsors, mm -hmm. and of course the support that I had from my family really carried me through. I had some very close knit friends that I made uh, at school that uh, we were all going through the same thing, okay. just to varying degrees, right? So um, the level of pain uh, varied from person to person, mm. but at least we had that in common. It was very hard. It was very difficult. Um, academically also, mm. you were challenged. Uh, but luckily, again, uh, my faith carried me through and, um, and, my, and my sponsors and my, and my family. Yeah, no, that's great to hear. Like the <clears throat> the networking and and your sponsors and military and friends and family. That's a that's a net that you have to actually look forward to, and then that's gonna help you to to succeed in your career. We all do that, right? So I keep doing. My wife is my my net, and sometimes when I feel down, etc. Nowadays, uh, but I imagine back then at the same time. So. So you're a supply of you were a supply officer in the Navy. So how actually you selected the job to be a supply um, officer in the Navy? Yes, I was a supply officer for 30 years. Mm -hmm. um, back in 1990, there mm -hmm. you go. Uh, that was my graduation year from the Naval Academy. We were actually women were actually able to select supply corps mm -hmm. okay. as a career field. We were restricted in other areas because mm -hmm. of the combat restrictions and and other uh, ceilings, if you will. Mm -hmm. But uh, Supply Corps was available to me. I learned that uh, supply officers were the business managers in the Navy. We could, we could navigate the ship. We mm -hmm. could drive the ship. We nice. could participate in special evolutions, do all those things our line counterparts could do. But we also took care of the budget. We took care of the food service, hospitality, mm -hmm. parts, pieces, all the logistics. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was very attractive to me. Yeah. And so as one mm -hmm. um, supply officer told me during a summer cruise that I could do all of the things that my warfare counterparts could do, but they couldn't do what I could do. Mm -hmm. And that my skills learned would be transferable to the outside once I decided yeah. to retire or, or transition from the from the Navy. So that that really stuck with me. No, and, and I echo everything you say because like I'm an officer, I'm a logistics officer myself. So I understand what the logistics in the army uh, and outside inside and the outside because this is a skill that you can transfer from once you finish and even either you do 20 25 years or you can do three four years there's a skill that you can actually follow through your civilian and, and we we actually pray that uh in the, in the logistics now you finish uh the naval academy 
Now you got the supply of being a supply officer. So what's next for Car uh, Captain Carla May Myers? Well, after graduation uh, from the Naval Academy, again, because of the combat restrictions, mm -hmm. we could either go, we women could go to shore duty or to a to an auxiliary platform. Okay. Because of a, a very distasteful experience I had as a midshipman uh, on a on an auxiliary platform, I could not wait to go on a combatant ship. And so my first duty station was at Roosevelt Rose, Puerto Rico. Oh my God. Yeah. You got you got me there down to <laughs> my heart. Okay. So I'm gonna let you continue. <laughs> to Roosevelt Rose in Puerto Rico. So no, so I served as the dispersing officer for the personnel support detachment. So back then we had um this was well before email, well before electronic <laughs> funds transfer. Wow. So we literally made the checks for the civilian and military population on board um, Roosevelt Roads. We delivered the checks and we cashed the checks. So wow. at any given time, I had over a million dollars in cash wow. in my safe. And I had about three or four cashiers. I mean, it was one Friday we would... It was military payday. The following Friday was civilian payday, and we'd rinse and repeat. Wow. But yeah. we had it down to a science. And uh, that was what we did on the on the bottom floor, if you will, of mm. the personnel support detachment. Okay. And in the upper floor, we, we took care of all of the personnel records. So this was manual. You When you physically came or Cannabis. reported on board with your... Yeah. <laughs> you know, with your rucksack <laughs> and your and your manila folder uh, with all your paperwork and we would process all of that and um, and make sure that everybody was properly received and or properly offboarded when it came time for them to transition. We also paid dealers bills. Okay. I had a fiscal accounting department of all civilians. So as an ensign in the Navy, I had the opportunity to um to supervise and and manage a, a team of six civilians which were local to puerto rico <laughs> um, and one great thing that that occurred there was that um, within my first six months i was able to obtain pay raises mm. for each and every one of my GS3 through seven at the time okay. uh, so that they could have obtained pay equity with their counterparts in the US. It had been over 13 years that their position descriptions had been reviewed and it had been equally as long since anyone had obtained a pay raise and, and of course accretion of duties they were paying all of the dealer's bills for the entire Caribbean wow. without any interest and always on time. And they were doing a lot of the jobs that their civilian, that their American counterparts were doing back in Norfolk. Mm. So we were able to obtain pay equity and um, that accomplishment really sticks in my mind. Mm because there wasn't anything we weren't able to achieve, right? Wow. And uh, it was just the, the courage to make change and to do better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, like he's, this uh, story, thanks uh, Carla for sharing with us because like this is, this is powerful. Um, and then I can imagine all this, like now we have all the automated system before then, back then we, you didn't have that. It's a more challenging your job was because now everything is by hand. You have to make sure like everything is accounted for. We're talking about millions and millions of dollars that today's yes. day is more like automated. You can make calls and you can transfer bank up to bank, etc. But before what I hear gather, it was not like that in Puerto Rico. No, it was it was basically a manual system. I had a manual cash book. Wow. Uh, millions of dollars I was mm -hmm. responsible for. Mm -hmm. And every day I had to uh, balance out. Um, but you knew you knew how to do that. Mm -hmm. You knew which numbers 
you know, would um, would add up um, and and how to close out at the end of the day. And, um, you know, we did it well. I had a I had an outstanding team. Nice. Nice. No, and, and that's that's the key. Right. So the team that's going to that you were managing, um, that they, they were holding up the, the whole, you know, operation that you were intel to. Um, in this case, that has just playing. So, how long do you actually stayed um, in the duty uh, station at Puerto Rico? For how long you stayed, in? and what's the most you liked being in Roosevelt Rose back then? What wasn't there to like? <laughs> What wasn't there to love? I was there for two years. Wow. Uh, Christmas on the beach, mm -hmm. uh, Playa Luquillo, Loisa, wow. empanadas. Uh, Bacalaito, alcapurria. Bacalaito, tío, no, no. Pongo relleno de la costa. Oh, my God. Salsa. Salsa. <laughs> wow. You know, there wasn't a weekend that I, um, that I wasn't in the condado at some point in time. <laughs> <laughs> it sounds uh, sounds like a like a like a sad job. It was very oh. sad, right? <laughs> oh, we worked really really hard. hard. This was a time. Um, as a matter of fact, we were considered the bank on base because this was after Hurricane Hugo. Oh yeah, okay. So, so the bank uh, was, you know, the commercial bank was wiped out, yeah, and so we were used for for cashing services almost daily. Nice, yeah. I was um, I was three years old when it happened. <laughs> I barely <laughs> I barely remember, but yeah, I know I know. Thank about... you for that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's a compliment. <laughs> no, no, but uh, it's it's glad to hear. Like it's my first time ever speaking to somebody that actually uh, worked in Roosevelt Rose. Uh, that as we know, a uh, few years ago, uh, in early two thousand thirteen. That's when um, the government shut shut it down yes. the, the operations sad for the island uh, of Puerto Rico because I now, and this is going to be off topic, but now Roosevelt Road is like a ghost town. Mm. Uh, it's not whatever it used to be when you were there like back in the 90s. 90s. Um, it's sad to hear that. But appreciated they sharing that for me uh, with me because I it's great to have this conversation with somebody that actually worked in the island that I wish I can actually serve <laughs> in the island and, and be stationed out there. Um, so now you spent two years in, in Roosevelt Rose in Puerto Rico, and, and then what was the next uh, step for you in your career? The next step for me was becoming a department head or going to sea. Mm -hmm. So when I was in Puerto Rico, I was able to obtain my maestria, my mm -hmm. my bachelor, excuse me, my master's degree, class, my class MBA. Mm -hmm. I took advantage of being on shore duty and uh, obtained my master's. Nice. And my while my colleagues were out at sea getting their warfare qualifications, I knew that at some point in time I would have to do that. Mm -hmm. So my next ship was the USNS Comfort out of Baltimore. Okay. And I was two years on board her. She had been sitting pier side for about three years until Operation Sea Signal and Uphold Democracy. And so we deployed down to the Caribbean, Haiti, uh, Cuba, and Jamaica for six months mm -hmm. and uh, processed migrants. Wow. Well, yeah. It was a joint effort mm -hmm. along with the, with the Marines, the Army, Certainly Coast Guard, um, you know, cutters were literally pulling um, individuals and families and, and, and children out of the water. Wow. They were transported to our hospital ship. Mm -hmm. They were given clothing, shelter, and of course, medical treatment. All of us at the time were, were uh, trained how to triage mm -hmm. patients. Uh, we were trained how to handle mass casualties and all of that. So we were trained in, in basic um, CPR and first aid. Mm -hmm. So that was a really an eye-opening experience to see that type of platform operate to its fullest capacity. Yeah, no, it, it sounds like a like a big operation that back then um, that you worked at. 
um, and, and I think you had you have great experiences and, and leadership that you can actually relate to that keep forming you in, in your earlier stages as a as an officer and and then so once you finish your operations and then what was like after that what happened to you again more uh, challenging roles mm -hmm. yeah um, I became a, um, gosh, where did I go after that? I went to uh, the supply course school Okay. to become an instructor. Oh, okay. okay. And um, so I enjoyed that for about three years. And then after that, it was time to go back to sea. Mm. And at that time, but I should say by that time, mm -hmm. the combat restrictions were lifted for women. Okay. Okay. So I was able to go on my first combatant, mm -hmm. combatant, which was the Arthur W. Radford DD-968, a destroyer out of Norfolk. And I love that tour. It was the, <laughs> it was extremely challenging. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, initially, I can say I was met with a lot of resistance because of the integration of women. Yeah. I was the first female department head on board, so the culture wasn't... Uh, so welcoming at the time uh but i am i can say that at the end of those two years i made some some solid friendships some hearts and minds were changed <laughs> uh for the good okay um and and folks understood that men and women can work side by side and be professional and um you know perform a mission yeah and, and get the job done and, and get it done well and that was one. Of, uh, that was one of my questions I had, um, and, and about, I was about to ask you because you you were the first female su senior supply uh, chain manager to to deploy in two different combat ships that you mentioned. And then, do you have any specific key challenges? And I know you keep mentioning because like the culture uh, had to change. Um, any key challenges that actually you face in transforming the ship shipboard culture, and how you actually improve your operational logistics back then? Um, to continue performing your role? Well, because we were customer service focused, mm -hmm. right? We had all of the, we had all of the customer service interfaces. I impressed upon my team that we weren't going to use foul language, that we were going to be kind, that we were going to be professional, that we were going to be as efficient as possible um, in all of our areas. Mm -hmm. um, that we were going to be about excellence. And excellence starts from at every level. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's, it's pride of ownership. So if your job is to fry the egg, if your job is to break out a part, um, do it well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so that was something that I, I really worked hard to instill with my team, that pride of ownership. Uh, to take to take something and and make it better while you're there. Yeah. No, and and and, and I think you, you were able to actually break all the stigmas and et cetera about it, whether the females actually can can actually do their job or not. And you were there to prove them wrong. Like, hey, I'm a female and I can I can do my job as any other male. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And then we're gonna continue drive forward. And we're gonna continue mission, one team, one fight. Back then. Exactly right. And that's not to say that uh, you know some of my counterparts' thought bubbles, <laughs> were, mm -hmm. you know, stayed in the thought. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them actually um, shared their thoughts, mm -hmm. and so that created a, a lot of friction. But again. Uh, through professionalism yep. and just owning your craft and and demonstrating something differently in behavior uh, is is really what I can um, hone in on that that was um, that helped make change. No, yeah, I and I totally agree with that, and we can see it uh, throughout the leadership. You, you retire as a as a uh, as a captain, right? So you continue throughout your career. So now we're going to pass to your, uh, you were the readiness division branch head and in the Pentagon, uh, so warfare integration. Can you speak more about that role? Because now we've seen that you, you started like 
getting more and more, you know, uh, role, role, important roles within the Navy. Wow. Uh, that role in the Pentagon was, was so eye opening. Mm -hmm. Um, we were the, the integrators for what was referred to the high nines, all the other warfare areas. And, um, certainly during, um, the PPBE process or the, or the, you know, as the, as the budgets rolled in and, and rolled out, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, we had to gather all, all that information from all the data from, from the other warfare areas and, and come up with the, an integrated solution. Mm -hmm. And I understood how some of the decisions that were made at that time would cause effects down the road um, out in the fleet. Uh, one of my responsibilities was, was regarding sparing and aviation spares was, was the hot button at the time. Mm -hmm. We were having a lot of issues in the depots, we were having um, issues with uh, our artisans in the depots aging out, retiring. There really wasn't um, a clear succession plan for those artisans, and so we were we were struggling out there in the fleet. And um, I then understood because of that tour you know, the differences between air land and surf land and, and who was able to get um, most of the attention and, and the budgets, because mm -hmm. in the Pentagon, we speak, everyone speaks around um, carriers, mm. right? Whereas the surface platforms, and these are my words, didn't receive as much love as I, as um, perhaps they, they could have, certainly from a financial perspective. Standpoint. Yeah. And then in that role, you manage uh, uh, portfolios totaling over $115 billion. So how, how did you, can you, uh, how do you balance the fiscal responsibility demands of that at that time would ensure operational readiness across the Navy. And, and this is what we we're, were talking about, how you actually were managing that. Well, it certainly wasn't done in a vacuum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, uh, you know, anytime uh, a pencil was, was pushed or a decision was made, it was made um, by the teams. Mm -hmm. And, you know, every type of um, mission, there were always trade-offs. Right. Mm -hmm. So uh, and our adversaries uh, contribute to a lot of the decision making as well, because mm -hmm. as they evolve, we have to evolve from a technology uh, from a technology perspective. Right. And at least ensure that our platforms and our personnel are are well equipped mm -hmm. to to accomplish a mission that um, that we need for them to accomplish. Yeah, and, and that's part of it. everything goes accordingly with the big skin of maneuver. Um, I know there's a future plans development, right? So they look ahead five years in advance and they start like bringing out and, and, and understanding the cost, the construct and how we fight in the, the, the fight. And then that budget comes in play as well because like, hey, we need to transition to this X, Y, and C platforms. Then the money has to follow what we need. And that's how we actually um, fit the, the, the units, right? So based on yes. the plans and, and the budget. Yes, those investments have to be maintained mm -hmm. and sustained over time. Mm -hmm. It's not just a one and done. Uh, particularly when there's a logistics tail involved. Um, you know, when you're working with the manufacturers, the original equipment manufacturers and our industrial base, um, there's a huge demand signal for, for parts and pieces and widgets and, and all of that. And um, that doesn't turn around overnight. Mm -hmm. You know, we might use FedEx to, <laughs> to transport and... <laughs> And, and fly a, a part uh, from one place to the next overnight, but the actual manufacturing of same does not happen as quickly. Yeah, and that's the beauty about the supply chain, right? So I, I just did my, my, my grad school in supply chain management and manufacturing is one of the shock points 
in in any supply chain because if you have one manufacturer that can hinder the whole supply operations in, in the big scheme of maneuver uh, but yeah now after the pentagon then i see here that you went to be at the dla so with the De defense logistic agency uh, as a deputy executive direct director um can you actually now you're full bur bulbor virginia which was like a couple minutes away from the pentagon and i i'm in richmond virginia so it's like a okay. an hour some change um but can you speak about the dla experience as a supply DLA was phenomenal. Um, I worked at the, it was a, a J32. We had a, a host of civilians that worked there. They were contracting officers that would deploy mm -hmm. uh, during any major um, unrest. Mm -hmm. You know, we had uh, when the Ebola breakout occurred. We had civilians that, that deployed to Africa. And, uh, and that was great. We had operational specialists that were stationed uh, abroad uh, with whom we, we communicated. And, uh, and part of that was another mission set, which is, you know, more on the classified side mm -hmm. that we um, had to integrate from, from OSD. Nice. Yeah, DLA, uh, yeah, that's our, you know, so the DLA works the big scheme of the supply chain management for the military. We have the AMC, DLA, all these agencies, and we have to be tied up at the tactical level. We need to understand all the way to the strategic and, uh, levels for the DLA to provide um, support. So most of like 90% of our parts are managed by the DLA. Uh, in at least in the army, I don't know in the in the navy, but it's great that you actually had the experience uh, working at DLA, the Defense Logistics Agency, back then. No, oh, absolutely. Now and then after the DLA, and then you moved down to the to be the chief of staff, director of operations um, in the miss, now missile Def miss, missile defense uh, agency. So that how was that role different from being at the J thirty two? at the Missile Defense Agency? I can't say that they were, you know, worlds apart. Mm -hmm. When you are a chief of staff, um, you, your role is to support your immediate boss, mm -hmm. but also ensure the, as we say, that the care and feeding of uh, the employees. So I'd like to say that a lot of my role was to um, Managed by walking around mm -hmm. uh, to lay eyes on our employees because sometimes uh, you know the boss is in is in meetings and unable to to get around uh, and to make sure that our that our employees were were healthy and productive and that their needs were being met as well. Nice, yeah. So definitely, uh, everything is related back to the supply and make sure that it. You, we fulfill what the needs are and then in your case you were more like a personal management and make sure like everyone it was good to go uh now so when is now did you start like thinking about retiring so when started that happening like around or what time you're like hey i did my time then it's about to retire and i'm gonna start doing you know other other things well, at 30 years, it's statutory retirement mm, okay. for me. So I had to hang up the uniform at some point in time. Mm. Uh, but to be honest, I was not fixated on that. Mm. I had so much going on um, in my personal life with, uh, I had my, one of my older brothers took ill. Uh, he developed cancer and, and prior to him, uh, lost my mom back in, in 2015. Okay. So those losses those you know those life circumstances uh shape you mm -hmm. a certain way and so i became uh more of a caregiver uh to my to my family members who were ill at the time as well as being uh, a mother to to uh my now two young adults okay and um you know working full time and 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 doing all the shuttling around uh to the sports activities and all mm -hmm. that just trying to be present 
Um, so really the last thing I knew it was on the horizon. I knew that I needed to transition, but I was not um, really fixated on it. And that's where the, the network came in, <laughs> uh, where one of my colleagues at the time said, hey, Carla, you're retiring. You need a job. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, my goodness, I, I could barely I could barely think about anything. I had the fog of grief mm -hmm. hanging over me because my brother had had passed away. And so it was through the network of this beloved colleague of mine uh, had introduced me to um, a family friend of his, which led to a conversation around, hey, what? What tricks of the trade uh, helped you transition out of the military to, oh, you might be interested in Deloitte. Hmm. And that, that's like, that's how you actually transitioned to, to be at Deloitte. And then, so once you started, so, so how different was like the Navy to Deloitte once you started like, okay, so this is, this is going to be my new role in the Lloyd. Uh, similarities, differences between like the Navy, now a civilian. How, can you speak about that? Yes. I didn't have a clue what I was getting into, <laughs> to be honest. Okay. I had no clue. Um, again, it was the height of the pandemic that I retired. I, on the heels of my brother's loss, uh, that fog of grief, um, mm. And right on the hills of my brother, I became a caregiver overnight for my for my father, who was ill. Mm -hmm. And uh, at that time, too, my son was transitioning to college. My daughter was uh, going to serve her first year at um, freshman year of high school at home. I had to figure all that out. And here I am taking off the uniform after 30 years mm -hmm. and jumping into an environment that I really did not understand well. I had been the client mm -hmm. before. I knew about Deloitte. I knew about contracting or contract tours, uh, but had never sat in the seat. Mm -hmm. And so all that transition, all of that <laughs> made for a... Um, made for a, a delicious recipe. That's that's all I can say about that. <laughs> now, um, I think my following question is, what advice would you give to all the veterans looking to enter the civilian workforce from your standpoint? Enter with your eyes wide open and make sure you do your homework. Ask the questions. Ask how you're going to be measured. Ask how you are going to be evaluated. Ask about your role. Ask about... Um, you know, what are, what is the standard of excellence? Because we are accustomed in the military. We know what it takes to, to get to the next uh, level or from one pay grade to the next. That's pretty fixed and finite for the most part. We know we have to go before a board and, um, and be selected with our peers. Make sure you understand all of that. And um, and that it's a good fit for you. Nice, appreciate it. And now, you you actually been involved in coaching transitioning veterans at Deloitte, right? Have you? And I then, absolutely. And then the question is, what are some of the common challenges veterans face, and how can they overcome to succeed in industry like logistics and supply chain management? In this case, because we're talking about supply chain management. Yeah, some of the challenges uh, a lot of us transitioning military members face are is adjusting, mm -hmm. adjusting to the new culture, um, getting integrated into the 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 new family, if mm -hmm. you will. Mm -hmm. um, if you've served significant tenure uh, in the military, you you have your family, you have your ohana, right? You have the folks. That you that you trust because you you know you're you're dodging bullets together, so mm -hmm. you forge a, a family right off the bat. Um, whereas transitioning into a a civilian role 
If you are not already familiar with everyone up and down and across the, the various chains, uh, leadership chains, then you have to um, really um, work at that and network, network up, down, and, and all around. And the other thing is branding. You know, what do you stand for now mm -hmm. that the uniform is off? Mm -hmm. You know, I, I knew what I what I was supposed to do as a, as a Navy Supply Corps captain, as a, for example, during my chief of staff role. Mm -hmm. Not so much during, um, not so much during transition, you know, so it's important to understand yeah. what you are getting into and what your role means, not only from a vernacular perspective, but where you fit in, in the broader business perspective. You know, what are you expected to do? Are you expected to go after business? Are you expected to open doors and, and make uh, contacts and make introductions for your leadership? Maybe all of the above, right? Mm -hmm. Just make sure you understand what you are getting into. And, and then one thing I wanna highlight that you actually did your master's while you were on, on on the Navy, higher education level matters. I, I think once you, I mean, once you get out of the retire, you're getting out of the Army or the Navy, uh, three, four years, 10 years, but you, you hit the, hey, you, you were doing your grad school while doing the Navy. And, and they, see if you were in the uniform, you should like be looking for that because that's gonna help you to stand uh, because like let's let's imagine we have 20 uh, let's say 100 veterans retiring and then they start filtering and they're, they're trying to apply everyone for Deloitte and then they start looking resumes like okay say I know you're a supply chain officer but then they're going to start looking okay so who has a higher education level versus this one etc and professionalism and I think that's relating back what you were saying about the mentorship. Yes, mentorship matters. And it's not just about, you know, the type of degree that you have. It's mm -hmm. about the experience that you have and the leadership that you're bringing mm -hmm. to the table as well. Um, it's about your network as well, mm -hmm. because we, we have vast networks in the military. But part of our transition is actually translating that into perhaps a business development mm -hmm. piece, and just translating in our minds and reframing in our minds how we can take the skills that we have learned, all the leadership that we have, and bring immediate value to bear mm -hmm. in the commercial space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, most definitely. I want to touch a point uh, back to when back in the Navy, I didn't touch it, but I just want to um, ask you this. Uh, the Woman at the Sea program, right? So mm -hmm. why inspire you actually to create that, uh, the, the Woman at the Sea program? And how actually impacted the Navy the approach to quality of life for all sail sailors, bo both men and women back in that program? Oh, thank you for that question, Manuel. Uh, this was my second combatant ship, the USS Macon Island out of San Diego. Uh, again, I was the the first female department head to, mm -hmm. to integrate this crew. Um, when I stepped on board the ship, my commanding officer pulled me aside and he said, Carla, Suppo, actually, I need for you to fix this problem. And I was like, what problem, sir? And he said, we have too many pregnancies on board. Mm. And I said, wow, <laughs> okay. 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 Um, that was a, a very tall order. But when I did a little bit of research and asked more questions, I found out that the majority of our female population was deploying for the first time. They were on board ship for the first time and they were primarily E3 and below. So when the Marines embarked, we were 3,500 strong, but less than 300 women. So when you look at those numbers, <laughs> it's like, wow. Mm -hmm. And my exact words were, well, everybody's a beauty queen. Mm -hmm. 
And so one of the things that uh, I endeavored to do was just to educate okay. and really, really harness um, the information that was coming from our medical community, mm -hmm. that was coming from our chaplain around morale and, uh, and morals, quite frankly, mm -hmm. and to really open up the aperture for for success in that hey we should establish some goals right establish some goals for yourself if you're stationed on board this ship for two to three years or five years whichever the case might be you know we're going to deploy you know we're going to, going to be in a uh, tax-free zone that means that you're going to be receiving more money at that particular time why don't we look at paying down some bills mm -hmm. why don't we look at saving some more money why don't we look at uh investing some money why don't we look into getting our warfare qualifications why don't we look at getting some courses underneath our belt mm -hmm. we had pace courses college uh instructors that sailed with us that was an opportunity to expand education so say all that to say that the focus was on educating our young female population that there was more to aspire to other than um you know getting a relationship and, and potentially getting off the ship because of an unwanted pregnancy at the time because what happens is even though the regulations may state that you can stay on board ship up until 20 weeks of pregnancy Nine times out of ten, the minute that you um, that the leadership finds out that you're or you pop positive for pregnancy, you're off the ship. Mm. And but one of the things that um, those young ladies weren't aware was that if they had a five year enlistment, if they were pregnant, became pregnant during the first year, they still owed that time, that remaining time. Mm. And so, you know, kind of instilled. You can plan for your pregnancy. Certainly, you can become a mother um, and exercise that right that you have. But let's think about the timing of that and when it might be optimal for you uh, to to become a mother while trying to balance your work life as well. Nice. No, it's... it's it, it, it... Here's like it's a, it was a great program that you established as a mentorship again for everyone on board. Now, in do they still um, doing this type of mentorship nowadays? That do you know? There's informally, yes. So, so they they actually get mentorship and, and make sure like people follow the rules and understand like, hey, this is how it works. Uh, about the pregnancy, I didn't know like about the, the the twenty weeks, and you have to get off the ship, and then definitely you, if you have five years in contract, guess what? You you're gonna do your time as a mom. You're gonna get your leave, but then you have to actually at one point you have to come back and and, and finish your your contract. That's good exactly to know. right. Carla, it was great. It's a great conversation. I appreciate it. Uh, it's fun uh, to actually have you in the podcast and and know more about you. Uh, again, it's an honor and a pleasure uh, hearing from somebody that actually perform duties at Roosevelt Roads. Uh, not only that, because you know it's down to my heart because I'm from Puerto Rico, and, and it's great to hear that. But overall, I appreciate it to actually share with us in the podcast. But before we close out, what advice will you give to anyone that's listening that is contemplating to join any military branch and they're looking for more information? reach out to anyone who's wearing the uniform and ask questions, uh, visit the service academies, talk to ROTC instructors, talk to students who are uh, wearing the cloth of this nation. Um, we need you, we need you in the ranks. And uh, again, I was one who, who thought that the military was not for me and, and here I am 30 years later, um, not looking back. Uh, I look on my service very fondly and, and, and so proud of my service and, and that of my, 
my family as well and everybody who serves, uh, whether it's one day or, um, you know, 30, 35 years, it doesn't matter. I want to say thank you for serving and for saying yes to um, wearing the cloth of this nation. Any other closing comments before we actually finish our podcast and our conversation? Thank you for the opportunity. Um, in the spirit of uh, Hispanic Heritage Month, mm -hmm. felicidades. Igual, igual. Y mucho gusto. Gracias, gracias. Ha igualmente. sido un, un placer, un gran honor. Gracias, gracias a ti y felicidades a todos en el mes de, la, de Hispanic Heritage Month que uh, he is from, uh, is from September 15 all the way to October 15. We are recording this September 27th, so we are in the middle of the Hispanic Heritage Month. And I, again, Carla, I appreciate it for being here tonight uh, with us in the podcast. And I'm going to close out. Uh, so... Carla, again, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing your incredible journey. Your, your leadership and experience in both the military and civilian sectors are truly inspiring. And I know our listeners have gained valuable insight from every, everything you shared tonight. To our audience, thank you for tuning in to this episode of the Answer Podcast. Don't forget to subscribe and leave us a, re a review on your favorite podcast platform. You can also follow, uh, follow us on YouTube for more in-depth conversation with leaders like Ka Carla Meyers. Until next time, I'm Captain Manuel Calo, and this is the Answer Podcast. Stay safe, stay motivated, and keep pushing boundaries. Take care, everyone. Let's go.